Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is the second episode of Routing Slips with Mass Transit. Now the first episode, gotta admit, that was a lot to swallow. That was covering a lot of the things that it tries to do. There's a lot to unpack and the, the goal of that first episode was to kind of show, hey, if you wanna look at the demo and get started, jump in. Here's kind of the high level concepts. Now I wanna dig into kind of the practical implementation details of routing slips and why they exist. So let me kind of jump in. Courier has, there's documentation on the website. I have it up. It, it isn't great. It isn't you know, gonna be comprehensive. I'm revamping that, so we're gonna get there. But I wanna talk about why we would use a routing slip. So let's look at and break down that registration process as if we were gonna do a typical orchestration using like a central controller to do that. So I've thrown together this SVG and the participants we have here, in this case, we have an orchestration saga. And again, this is not how demo, demo registration does it. This is how you would typically do something like this. And whether you're using HTTP, whether you're using messaging, any of those things, this is what we would expect to see if we were orchestrating that behavior. So we would, we would have three different consumers or services, the license, register, and payment service cons consumers. And we would have some central thing, whether it's a, I mean, it could be as simple as an API controller, but in this case, maybe it's a saga, you know, maybe we're doing something like that. But it's some central point of orchestration that's happening within our application. And what that thing is doing, you know, we'll take the case where we have a license. So it's going to go out and it's going to send a request to verify the license. That's going to get processed. It's going to respond with license valid. We're going to go and register the rider. That rider is going to be registered. Then we're going to go process the payment and we're going to get the payment processed. And all three of those calls are going to happen. They're going to be orchestrated and we're going to have a request and a response back to that centralized controller for each one. And then the smarts are in that orchestration. So for instance, if we don't have a license, we're gonna skip that first consumer. We're gonna go straight to register the rider and process the payment. And then our payment processing, let's say our payment fails. This is where things get a little bit more complicated because now the orchestrator has to say, okay, well, I've got the license, I've got the rider registered, I processed the payment, but that payment failed. So if the payment failed, now the orchestrator has to know, I need to go unregister that rider. And if they don't do it, you've got a registration out there of someone who isn't gonna show up because that overall process didn't complete. Uh, the registration can fail also. In this case, it's not as big a deal because the license doesn't store any state or allocate anything. It's just checking to verify that the license is valid. And if the license is valid, it just comes back. So that's, that's kind of a classical approach of how you would deal with it if you had a single process that was calling out to multiple services to do these things. Now, as we discussed in the previous episode, by using a routing slip, we're able to make that a distributed transaction. And when it's distributed, we're switching to a mode called choreography. Now, in this orchestration-based approach I just covered, all of the state is being captured in this, whatever's managing and orchestrating that process, whether it's a saga, whether it's, a, whether it's the call stack on an API controller that's just waiting and waiting and waiting. I mean, it's, it's whatever that is, that state is being entirely held at this level, at the process registration saga level within this approach. And what's different about Courier, or by using a routing slip, is all of that state is on the wire carried between all of those different components or activities in the case of a routing slip. So let's look at the routing slip based approach of this same transaction process. And as you can see here, I've renamed these to activities because they're activities, they aren't just straight up consumers. And the process registration consumer is still there, but it's just kicking things off with the routing slip. So the routing slip is being created, the activities are being added to that itinerary that tells the routing slip what to do. And I'll go over the implementation of how that routing slip works in a second. But let's look at that same flow of registration from a choreography perspective using the routing slip. 
In this place, the routing slip is built, and that routing slip is transferred across the wire with all of the state to the license activity. The license activity runs, says, hey, everything is great, person passes, awesome, pass it to the next activity. So it then sends that message to the next activity's execute endpoint. That activity execute does the registration, adds that state of that registration ID to the routing slip, sends that on down to the next activity, the payment activity, which processes, calculates the payment information, and then the activity ends at that point. The itinerary is empty. All of the activities have been processed. The routing slip completed event gets produced. It gets sent back to the, uh, it, not necessarily the consumer, but it gets sent back to the, the state machine in our demos example, which then keeps track of that and knows that it completed. But at this point, the transaction is complete. And the big difference between this is if you look at the number of interactions required, in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six message exchanges that have to happen for this to complete, plus a number of data accesses at each of these points. If we go with the routing slip approach, it's one, two, three, four. So there's two less message exchanges, which reduces the overall latency because we're, we're sending less messages. Now, admittedly, with business logic, the message overhead isn't great, but it's less things we have to keep track of. The other nice thing, and I mean, it's, it's the same in orchestration or choreography, is the routing slip itinerary is built based on what has to happen. So since we conditionally add the license check activity, we don't need to add it to the itinerary if we aren't going to do it, and there, by skipping that activity entirely and sending the routing slip directly to the registration activity, registering, processing the payment, and returning back. Now faults are handled entirely on the routing slip as well. So instead of the first element, the consumer having to know about the registration having to be rolled back or compensated, the routing slip in this case is sent to the license validation activity, it executes. The routing slip is then sent to the registration, it registers the rider. The routing slip is then sent to the payment activity. The payment activity faults. At this point, the fault triggers the activity log, which is in the routing slip, which I'll cover in a second, to send the routing slip back to the address, first address in that log or the most recent address in that log to compensate that registration, after which that compensation produces the routing slip faulted event. And the nice thing about that is the routing slip itself manages the state of what would have to be compensated. So the orchestrator doesn't need to know about it. What's great is if I wanted this particular activity to say, add another activity or modify the itinerary based on additional things that needed to happen, I could do that. And if those activities required compensation, all of that information and knowledge would be stored in the routing slip and the original orchestrator doesn't have to know anything about it to allow those new activities to participate in compensation. So it's putting the logic in the routing slip and using that routing slip as state on the network. It's in the message that's being sent between these services. And because the messages are durable, that state is durable. It isn't going anywhere. Well, in reality, it's going everywhere and not staying in one central place. So the other registration failed, let's say the registration fails. Again, the, the routing slip, the license gets validated, it goes to that registration, and then it immediately faults. Note that the compensation is not called because if the activity itself, if the execute method on the activity faults, the compensate is not called because it never completed. So therefore it's never added to that compensation log. Same thing with license failed. If it gets there and it blows up, it's going to immediately exit out. None of those other activities will even have a chance to execute. So that's the difference in the approach that's taken with routing slip and why you might use it. Um, I'll cover some of the really cool things you can do with routing slips in a later episode, but I wanted to get these understandings because like I said, that first episode, 
uh, some of the early feedback I got on it was, man, there's a lot to unpack here and you got a lot of follow up to do. And I was like, yeah, I know. So definitely going to be getting that out there. This is one of the key concepts to understand about why this routing slip approach makes sense. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to look at how this looks on the broker. And just this is going to be a quick peek because, as I mentioned, each of these different routing slip steps has their own execute address when that itinerary is built. And we saw that in the demo app. When we look at RabbitMQ, we can see the queues that are created, the activities that, like the registration activity, it has two queues, an execute and a compensate. License verification, it has one, execute, because it's an execute only activity. Process payment, it has an execute and a compensate because it stores compensation information in that routing slip. Beyond that, we have the saga that we captured and then we have the two separate consumers. The interesting thing is if we look at all the different message types we have out here, like get registration, contracts, all these de details, these don't, these only map to like the state machine that is interested in them. There's no routing slip type anywhere in the exchanges, which all the other message types are there. Routing slips are special. They don't get routed by the broker. They're explicitly sent to the addresses. So when we look at the registration consumer, that's why we're calling this get activity address is to directly send those messages to the execute endpoint of the activities, whether it's an execute only activity or a regular activity that supports compensation. Because that's the only address we need to know, the execute address. Now let's look at what a routing slip is. I've opened up the contract type in the mass transit assembly and the routing slip is a message type, it is valid, and it contains a number of different things. The tracking number we mentioned, it's a unique ID for that execution of the routing slip. Little guidance tip here, don't reuse these. If you're going to retry a distributed transaction, give it a new tracking number. If you have information relevant to your reason for running that routing slip, put that in a variable. So just a piece of information there. The timestamp when it gets created, just for tracking purposes. And then we have a lot of collection. We have the itinerary, which is what all the added activities get put into. We have the activity log, which is purely just a log for informational purposes, what all happened. We have the compensate log, which are all of the activities that can be compensated. And those are added to this list as activities complete and add compensation information. This is what we use to roll back and go back and pre-compensate those previous activities in the most recently completed order backwards. Uh, we have variables, which lets us put anything in here. This is the state that is carried along with the routing slip. And then we have execution uh, exceptions that happen. So if an activity throws an exception, we keep those around so that we can produce the exception events later on. And then we have the subscriptions, which let us subscribe to events produced by the routing slip beyond just publishing them. So let's take a closer look at like the itinerary. The itinerary is a list of activities. An activity is really simple. It has a name, which really is just for informational purposes. It, it, it can be anything, it doesn't matter. We have the address, which is where that activity is executed. And then we have the arguments for that activity. And the arguments are just a dictionary of string object, but this is what is used to pass information, you'll notice there is no type information in here whatsoever. And when we build the routing slip in the consumer, we're just passing anonymous types to those activities. The, the fact that I'm using get activity address and this is irrelevant, this type is not in any way used to validate, check, or ensure that the arguments are correct. And the reason for that is arguments can be sourced from two places. They can be sourced from here, which is specifically added properties to the activity. And they can be sourced from variables, such as if I said builder.addVariable, and I could give it a name such as event ID, and I could put what the event ID is. And by putting it in there as a variable, I don't have to put it anywhere else. I could take it out of here and it would still work because the arguments are built from the activity arguments 
plus any variables that are defined in the routing slip. So if you have big properties, you can put them in the variables, and if multiple activities use them, each one will get a copy just by referencing them by name and an appropriate type in their arguments list. So I just didn't want to go into that too much, but just kind of to let you know. So that's kind of how the routing slip works on the wire. The compensate logs as each activity executes. We keep track of the execution that happened. The compensation address where the message should be sent to compensate that activity is written in there. So that's written by the activity since it knows its compensation address and it will populate that so it can roll backwards through those completed activities to compensate them. And then this data is just used to materialize the log type that's used for the activity. So that is how all of that underlying mechanics work and why the routing slip approach makes a lot of sense for building out distributed transactions. And distributed transactions are really just one use case. I've actually built some pretty complex routing and processing and validation systems using routing slips because, because of the fact that it's a dynamic itinerary and I can add, I can revise, I can change the routing slip as it goes on. I can terminate it early and I'll go into some of those things in it you know, one of the subsequent episodes of this series. But I really just wanted to make sure that in this episode, you got a good understanding of the difference between orchestration and choreography and why the choreography approach of the routing slip is really useful for enabling these kind of distributed workflows. So hopefully this gave you a little bit more information. Uh, there'll be more to come. Just wanted to kind of get this out there and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.